have to do something to a bunch of amateurs on this. I think so. So how are you tonight is Dr. Richard Copley, who's uh, an expert in Edgar Allan Poe, amongst other subjects. And, uh, and if I get things wrong, because I'm not reading it from a script, um, I know that you are a professor of literature um, in the US with numerous awards. And you've written a book um, that compares the, the sort of mirroring uh, effects from a number of different writers. And that the and that Lewis Carroll is one of the sections from that book, and that's what we're going to discuss um, today. So I'll let you um, drive, Richard, and then if we've got, we'll have some questions at the end, and people can also put questions in the question box, and we'll we'll go through those at the end as well. Very good. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be speaking with you, members of the Lewis Carroll Society. Many thanks to Jane Skelly for setting this up, to Sarah Jardine Willoughby for hosting, to Steve Folan, the chairman, for introducing me just now, and to Brian Silby, the president, and to the Lewis Carroll Society Committee for welcoming this talk in the first place. I'm going to give a little introduction and then I'll give the, uh, the presentation. The mythological centers of Lewis Carroll's Alice books was originally a chapter in my 2018 book, The Formal Center in Literature. And I hold up the book. Explorations from Poe to the Present. Other chapters in the book deal with a range of authors from Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville to James Joyce and Zadie Smith. I'll briefly offer some background to the Lewis Carroll piece before I get to the argument, and I'll be glad to take questions and comments after the talk. I'm a retired English professor from Penn State Du Bois. I've long been interested in beginnings and endings of works of literature. Perhaps this began in high school when a teacher suggested that I read W. Somerset Maugham's Of Human Bondage. I was very disappointed in the opening line, the day broke gray and dull, especially for what, for what was billed on the dust jacket as the greatest novel of our time. With slight hope, I jumped to the last line, which closed, and the sun was shining. And I thought, okay, this I can deal with. The language may be simple, but he had a sense of the whole. It was in graduate school when my interest in beginnings and endings developed interest in centers. I read Edgar Allan Poe's one novel, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, a sea novel published in 1838, and I was knocked out by the mysterious ending, A White Apparition Appears Near the South Pole, and the novel ends. I eventually wrote my dissertation on the book. I discovered that even as the beginning and ending were symmetrical, they framed a significant center. In the 13th of 25 paragraphs, in the 11th of, I'm sorry, in the 13th of 25 chapters, in the 11th of 22 paragraphs, a week into a two week period, the character Augustus, representing Poe's brother Henry, died on August 1st, just as Henry had died on August 1st. There were encoded facing mirrors at the beginning and end of the novel that infinitely reflected the death at the center, suggesting infinite memory of the loss, what Poe later called, when writing about his raven, mournful and never-ending remembrance. So I became interested in the centers of literary works, and here's where the Alice books came in. I should also add that I was, and am, a word and phrase reverser. When I was a kid, I was told that my name backwards is Dratcher Yelpock, and since that time, I've had a habit of turning words and sentences around. This is a good habit to be in to read Lewis Carroll. I'd like to clarify a term that I will use in my argument, chiasmus. This word pertains both to beginnings and endings and to reversibility. It is the pattern A, B, 
BA, as in, and I have a little diagram here, as in, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It's called chiasmus because of the Greek letter X, chi, formed by linking the like terms. And I'll have reason to re return to that. There is a variability to the meaning of chiasmus. It could be conservative, always returning to the beginning, or it could be radical, always challenging its first half in the reversed second half. And there is a critical circularity to the trope. That is, we circle from A to B and continue with B and circle back to A. This is, there is a round and round quality to chiasmus, a quality that I think would make it very attractive to Lewis Carroll. Finally, there is the term hermeneutic circle. Hermeneutics is just interpretation. The hermeneutic circles means simply that in interpreting a work of literature, we circle around from the detail to the whole, back to the detail and back to the whole. This term is certainly applicable to my argument about Alice. And so here we go. The mythological centers of Lewis Carroll's Alice books. Alice says to her cat at the end of Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there, tell me, Dinah, did you turn to Humpty Dumpty? I think you did. However, you'd better not mention it to your friends just yet, for I'm not sure. Martin Gardner asks at the end of his edition of the Alice books, the annotated Alice, why did Alice think Humpty was Dinah? He cites what he terms an ingenious theory that even as Humpty Dumpty spoke to a king, a cat may look at a king. He also mentions an essay that observes that the name Dinah begins and ends with the initials of Humpty Dumpty reversed. Still, the question remains an open one. I will often offer an answer applying a center-centered approach. I will provide a new reading of the Alice books, one complementary to other readings, including analyses of Carol's life, such as Morton Cohen's biography and others, and considerations of Carol's reading, such as Ronald Reichert's study and others. I will curve around from the whole to a part to the whole, or from a part to the whole to a part, the hermeneutic circle. A circle, it will be seen, is singularly a singularly appropriate image for reading the Alice books, and the hermeneutic circle will take us on another adventure in Wonderland, one that will lead to a new key. The Alice books are works of delicacy and whimsy, but they are also works of sturdy structure of singular symmetry. We may consider first Alice's adventures in Wonderland, proceeding from the outside in. An overview of that classic reveals repeated framing, we see in the opening poem about Carol's first telling the story, four stanzas into the seven, the three little sis sisters in friendly chat with bird or beast and half believe it true, the tale. Then we see in the closing four paragraphs about Alice's sister's dream at the beginning of the third paragraph. So she sat on with closed eyes and half believed herself in Wonderland. The word half in both cases, occurring halfway through the relevant passage, encourages the reader to think in terms of halves. The symmetrical phrasing in the two passages, half believe and half believed, confirms the evident framing. The symmetry continues, including the story's beginning in chapter one with Alice and her sister on the river bank and closing there in chapter 12 as well. After the beginning, still in chapter one, Alice wonders what a candle flame looks like after it's been blown out. Even as before the ending in chapter nine, she wonders what happens after the number of hours spent on lessons diminishes to nothing. The tale slash tale of the mouse in chapter three, visually underscored by the emblematic poem, is balanced by the head of the Cheshire cat in chapter eight, visually underscored by the John Tenniel image. Furthermore, the caterpillar's returning to the beginning of the conversation in chapter five is echoed by the re imagined return to the original seating 
at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party in Chapter 7. The anticipated halfway point of the 12th chapter, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, occurs at the end of Chapter 6. To use an analogy appropriate to mathematician Charles Dodgson, we are bisecting a straight line. The critical central passage concerns Alice and the Cheshire Cat. All right, said the cat, and this time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tale and ending with the grin, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. Well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat? It's the most curious thing I ever saw in all my life. We have here two significant and characteristic patterns in the Alice books. First, the use of heads and tails. And second, the appearance of two words and their reappearance in reverse order. Carol's employing the terms cat and grin, and his inversion of these terms to grin and cat is clearly chiastic. And even as the chiasmus suggests an X, the pattern ABBA also forms a circle. Carol's particular reliance on this pattern and its relation to the heads and tails pattern will be clarified as we proceed. Our focus on the whole of Alice's and what Adventures in Wonderland has led to the framing and then to the center. The pattern of heads and tails is evident throughout the book, not only in the mouse's tail and the Cheshire cat's head, but also in Alice's chin striking her foot and in her placing the lizard in the jury box head downwards as it was waving its tail about in a melancholy way. The pattern of chiasmus, itself involving a head, A, and a tail, B, is apparent early on in Alice with Alice's questions, do cats eat bats? And do bats eat cats? Later with Alice trying to find her way out, and then adding, everything is so out of the way down here. And, rep and repeatedly, including the March Hare's cautioning Alice, you might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. Alice is noting that the girls were in the well and the Dormouse is responding, of course they were, well in. And even the befuddled White King's murmuring, important, unimportant, unimportant, important. Again and again, head and tail, beginning and end are united. Carol repeatedly writes of Alice's wondering what happens at the end of a sequence, as in passages noted, when a candle flame goes out, when the ever-diminishing lessons end, and when everyone at the tea party has moved around to the end. These intimations of mortality suggest why, when the White King in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland advises the White Rabbit very gravely, only begin at the beginning and go on till you come to the end, then stop, there was dead silence in the court. The question is whether one stops or not. Carol elaborates the same matter by repeatedly referring both to both the null set, no room, no room, cry the March Hare, the Mad Hatter, and the Dormouse, and infinity, Alice in her book imagining that she should appear in a book, and the readers realizing that since Cheshire cheeses were once made in the shape of cats, the Cheshire cat would eat the rat that would eat the cheese. And the concern with beginnings and ends may be seen as involving the process of composition as well. For literal language generates figurative language, and in the Alice books, that figurative language generates the little, literal. In Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Alice is literally falling asleep and literally growing up. Since it's tea time, the March Hare literally dips his watch in a cup of tea. The examples are abundant, and they are the source of much of the humor. Beginnings and ends continue to turn. What links the beginnings and ends, the heads and tails, in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland? What is the key? I would argue that there is a specific visual clue. The whiting. Whiting's Alice tells the Mock Turtle and the have their tails in their mouths, and the mock turtle and the griffin agree. This is what seems to me to suggest the controlling image of Carol's masterpiece, the mythical serpent with its tail in its mouth, the Ouroboros. 
That image represents the pattern we have noted, the repeated joining of beginning and end, the repeated union of head and tail. This image is nicely foreshadowed by the daisy chain that Alice considers making, a bracelet or necklace of daisies in which the flower of one daisy is fastened to the stem of the next, head to tail. And we find the resonant image of the Ouroboros again in Through the Looking Glass, a book whose 150th anniversary we are now celebrating. The two Alice books match. In this connection, it is telling that some years later, Carol was concerned that the frontispiece of Sylvie and Bruno concluded and that of Sylvie and Bruno match. Indeed, he acknowledged to his illustrator, Harry Furness, I have a passion for symmetry. We may initially observe the framing and through the looking glass. Here again, we may proceed from the outside in. The opening poem addressed to Alice is paralleled by the closing poem that acrostically honors Alice. The subsequent cluster of details in chapter one, including Dinah's washing the white kitten, the black kitten's chasing its own tail, and Alice's placing the red queen in front of the black kitten, corresponds to the cluster of details in chapters nine through 12, including the red queen's running after her shawl, Alice's placing the black kitten and the red queen facing one another, and Dinah's washing the white kitten. Alice is later responding to the White Queen's acceptance of a run that yields no progress in Chapter 2, well, in our country, you generally get to somewhere else, relates to Alice's responding to the White Queen's mention of a group of Tuesdays together in Chapter 11. In our country, there's only one day at a time. The absence of names in Chapter 3 is balanced by the abundance of names in Chapter 8 as is the Battle of Tweedledum and Tweedledee in Chapter 4, with the Battle of the Red Knight and the White Knight in Chapter 8. The White Queen's running in Chapter 5 recurs in Chapter 7, even as the Mad Hatter, who is in prison in Chapter 5, is only just out of prison in Chapter 7. Again, the halfway point in Carol's 12-chapter book occurs at the end of Chapter 6. We may recall the analogy of bisecting a straight line. The vital passage concerns the fall of the proud Humpty Dumpty, a passage that makes literal the familiar caution drawn, drawn from Proverbs 16, 18, that pride goeth before a fall. At this moment, a heavy crash shook the forest from end to end. This crash at the center of through the looking glass has the pride of place, a place that reveals the result of pride. The phrase end-to-end -end is also suggestive, and we do have a vital parallel with the disappearing Cheshire Cat at the center of Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Ostensibly, perhaps, we have another puzzling riddle, like why is a raven like a writing desk? Something like, why is a feline like an egg? Yet an essential similarity may emerge on reconsideration. The first central passage concerns a cat's vanishing from tail to grin. And the second central passage concerns the death of an egg. The underlying pattern of both passages is the union of the end and the beginning, the Ouroboros. Whether the mythical creature is suggested spatially, tail to grin, or temporally, death of an egg, it is still the same creature. And so we may answer both Alice's question, tell me, Dinah, did you turn to Humpty Dumpty? And Gardner's question, why did Alice think Humpty was Dinah? The Ouroboros passage at the center of Alice's adventures in Wonderland concerning the Cheshire Cat, the Wonderland version of Dinah, turned to the Ouroboros passage at the center of Through the Looking Glass concerning Humpty Dumpty. Indeed, D.H. did become H.D. The centers of the two books are as dense as the story them stories themselves seem light and airy. The patterns of heads and tails and through the looking glass is suggested not only by Humpty Dumpty, the egg soon to die, but also by Alice's asking the white knight, how can, how can you go on talking so quietly head downwards as she dragged him out by the feet? And in that second book, instances of chiasmus continue to appear from Humpty Dumpty's reciting first, but he was very stiff and proud, and then, and he was very proud and stiff, to the white knight's declaring of his mousetrap I suppose the mice keep the bees out, 
or the bees keep the mice out. To Alice's saying of the Red King, he was part of my dream, of course, but then I was part of his dream too. Head and tail, beginning and end, continue to be united. An attention to the end of a sequence continues. The bread and butterfly will die because it can never find its only food, weak tea with cream in it. And then there is still the null set, to be able to see nobody, and at that distance too, marvels the White King. And infinity, Alice's dreaming of dreaming. Figurative language generates literal language in Through the Looking Glass too. Most flowers are asleep because their beds are too soft. A butterfly becomes an actual bread and butterfly, and the frog, with a frog in his throat, gets in the spirit of the looking glass world, replying, to answer the door, what's it been asking of? Beginnings and ends are still circling around. How is the Ouroboros intimated in Through the Looking Glass beyond the fall of Humpty Dumpty? There are two clues, the Black Kitten and the Red Queen. As aforementioned, the Black Kitten was running after its own tail, just as the Red Queen was later running round and round after her own shawl. Later, Alice says that the Black Kitten must have been the Red Queen. The two images suggest, like the whiting, tail and mouth, in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and the daisy chain, stem to flower, the serpent with its tail in its mouth, end to end, the Ouroboros. The mythic figure has occasionally been mentioned in criticism on Alice. Kenneth Burke links the unending Mad Tea Party to the Ouroboros, which he suggests is emblematic of the digestive tract. Margaret Bo Burns offers a chiastic solution to the Mad Hatter's riddle, a raven eats worms, a writing desk is worm eaten, citing Eric Newman's The Origins of the History of Consciousness and its discussion of the maternal Ouroboros, and concluding that the laws of the alimentary canal reign supreme. Anna Kershey proposes that the blending of reality and fiction in the Alice books recalls the mythical Ouroboros snake biting its own tail. But Amy Mandelker comes closer than the others to clarifying the essential pattern. She writes, the question of where something ends or begins suggests the figure of the Ouroboros, which appears in Alice as the whiting, a fish with its tail in its mouth. She goes on to link the fish to the death and resurrection of Christ. And given that, as already noted, the Cheshire cat as cheese may be said to eat the rat that eats the cheese, she asserts that, the Cheshire Cat is a metaphor for the snake that eats itself. Mandelker's, Mandelker's insights are strong, but they could go farther. My own view, as indicated, is that the Ouroboros is the single image permeating the two Alice books, holding each of them together, uniting the two, and serving as the center of both. The literature on the Ouroboros is substantial. The image goes back to Egypt, and the traditional interpretation of the snake with its tail in its mouth is as an emblem of eternity. Carol's abiding concern in the Alice books is death. As he writes in the prefatory poem to Through the Looking Glass, we are but older children, dear, who fret to find our bedtime near. However bedtime may yield to awakening, I would argue that the Alice books are Carol's covert meditation on death and the afterlife, with the Ouroboroc image conveying his hope expressed in the words of the whiting in the lobster quadrille. What matters it how far we go, his scaly friend replied. There is another shore, you know, upon the other side. The further off from England, the nearer it is to France. Then turn not pale, beloved snail, but come and join the dance. We may find the man behind the Ouroboros in the 1876 and Eng Easter greeting to every child who loves Alice wherein Carol writes to his child readers explicitly of a brighter dawn than this, a new and glorious day. For the day that celebrates the resurrection of Christ, Carol speaks of the rebirth of all. And the man behind the Ouroboros appears occasionally in his personal writing. For instance, Charles Dodgson wrote in his journal of November 30th, 1881, concerning the end of his career as a lecturer, there is a sadness in coming to the end of anything in life. Man's instinct clings to the life that will never end. And he wrote in a letter to Mrs. C. H. M. Milam of September 5, 1884, I think we treat death far too much as the end of all things. 
The beliefs of Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodgson, were Christian, of course, but his faith may be recognized in many religions. The hermeneutic circle, then, yields an Ouroboric circle, a circle of unending rebirth at the centers of the Alice books. To return to the beginning, I think I'm right. And yes, you can mention it to your friends. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. There you go. I've unmuted myself. I'll be honest. I was that was certainly not something I was expecting. Me now. I knew the um, or a Boris. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, I knew about the or a Boris from um, from mythology, and I was intrigued on how you were going to be able to map that into the into the Alice stories. Um, you know, and I'll be honest that even in you know, um, my own examination of it and the other speakers that I've often heard, I've never heard of it being described in such a structured way. Because generally when it's described, it's uh, almost as if it's a spont you know, it's um, spontaneous rather than structured. And it's, it's very interesting to hear. I mean, now I'm going to have to go back, reread the books. And you know, to spot all of these things that um, that, that may have been there before. That uh, that would be a, an ultimate sign of of uh, uh, success. It would be a great pleasure to 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 know that you've done that and uh, found some of it anyway. No, it's it's true. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, as you were saying it, now I've made some notes uh, because um, we've got some people who don't use it. So even on the you know the notes that I've taken, you know, chiasmus is obviously not an expression that, um, you know, comes up. So that, that's quite an interesting one. And you're right that, um, I mean, even in the Lewis Carroll Society, you know, in the UK, you know, we, everyone keeps looking for their recurring motifs, if you like, but everybody finds the ones that they, you know, the ones that they enjoy. Um, but to kind of have it broken down, you know, that within each story they mirror, and then across the stories, they mirror. And, um, and I'm going to have to look up this thing about um, Cheshire cheese in the shape of an animal because I've never, I've never heard that before as well. But um, yeah, I mean, I honestly, I really want to think. I mean, it's been, it's really been, um, it's quite a thrilling um, talk. And uh, and yeah, and it's given me, I mean, personally, you know, enough um, insight that now I've got, like I said, I have, I've got to go back. I have to, I, you know. I thought I knew, it's like lots of things. You think you know the stories really well, and then all of a sudden someone explains them to you, and uh, you know, and then you've got to go back and you know you review them as well. I mean, I think that I mean, I'll let some of the other people ask questions as well. But I mean, we pointed out, you know, um, some of the other motifs that are in there about you know rebirth, religion. You know, these these are very popular as well. So. Um, yeah, and obviously with um, Charles Dodgson being a religious figure, it would have been something that influenced him, you know, when he was writing it as well. And it's a, it's quite a, it's quite a hefty piece of analysis that you've done as well with all the Thank other you. authors that are, you know, that are brought in. You know, I'll, I'll confess that I'm often quite skeptical when um, people try and do um, psychoanalysis of the Alice stories as it wasn't something that really came about until after um, the books are written. But something like this, you know, actually works on the things that influenced him, the way he structured it, and particularly that quote as well, that, you know, that he likes symmetry. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, I know that um, Sarah wants to unmute everybody else. Um, sure. I know that... Um, um, Steve, I can't actually unmute. Everybody's got to unmute themselves. Okay. So if you have a, a question, or Richard, if you want to unmute and ask, or or put it in the um, chat room if you're too shy, um, and I'll you know and I'll read it out. Steve, Steve, I have a a question. It's, if you can hear me, okay. Yep, you're you're fine. Yep. 
Um, f absolutely fascinating, uh, Richard, if I may use your first name. Um, one of the things that uh, intrigues me about uh, these um, parallels and uh, symmetrical circlings, if you like, that you've uh, uncovered here is what we do know, certainly about the first book, but not about the second Alice book, is that the initial version was certainly extemporized. And, and uh, uh, of course, that didn't have the Tea Party chapter, which you've been talking about, nor the Cheshire Cat, actually, or the Duchess and so on. But I just wonder whether you think from your, your reading and your research, whether the way of thinking which leads to the, the uh, arguments that you've been presenting was something which perhaps was part of Dodson's character. So even if he was extemporizing, he was thinking in these uh, symmetrical, uh, cyclical kind of patterns. It was just so much part of his nature. I mean, you, you mentioned the prefatory and uh, closing poems. And of course, the closing poem of Wonderland uh, is then mirrored in the opening poem of Sylvie and Bruno, for example, where, where he picks up the question asked at the end of, of uh, is all our life then but a dream and then seeks to answer it in the opening prefatory poem to Sylvie and Bruno. Do you think it was just part of his nature and that um, even when he was telling stories perhaps it just was naturally there? I think so and I think he also built it up as he took the story and wrote it down and refined it and revised it. I think the inclination was natural uh, especially given his background as a mathematician and his background as a, uh, a reverend. Um, it was part and parcel of who he was. And then as an artist, he sharpened, he defined, and uh, brought it into a, a bolder relief, yet not so bold that it would be something we would trip over. It, it's very subtle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also just wittily, oh, I hoped it was wittily, but um, just facetiously, if not, um, just put on the comment box early on when you were talking about uh, uh, wondering, the, the, uh, the question of wondering. Um, if, we, if we ever we think of uh, the, the Wonderland as a place of wonders, a land of wonders, but but as you were presenting it, it, it is also a place where one goes to wonder. Yes, thank you. I'm That's just being playful there. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Could I make a comment? Yeah, um, please do. It's just a comment, really, but it fits in with the whole theme of what you're talking about, which I enjoyed immensely. Um, the bit in Sylvie and Bruno, which I'm sure you know about, you just didn't mention it, was the little brooch that uh, has the wording, Sylvie will love all, written on it, uh, which can also be read as all will love Sylvie, which, uh, of course, is nice. circular. And I've got the copy of the thing, I think, I don't know if you can see that... Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I for just that. thought that fits in with the theme very Absolutely. well. Yeah. Absolutely. Could I just ask a question? Yeah. Um, I noticed that you mentioned uh, a similarity between chapters four and chapter eight, and also chapter five and chapter seven. Have you noticed what is common between those two? Well, uh, if I go back, to, if I go back to my text, just to remind they both you. add up to twelve. <laughs> they both add up to twelve. So, so chapter six would be Humpty Dumpty, and two Humpty Dumpties would also add up to twelve. I just wondered whether you yes, thought yes. about that. Well, the, the symmetry, uh, of course, is a framing that occurs on both sides, and um, it, it stands to reason that numerically the chapters of a given frame would add up to twice the center, as you've just pointed out. I've never... Ah, very never good. Thought, very good, good. yes. Absolutely. So one would add up... One would join with 11, two with 10, etc. Yes, yes, yes. Three yes. with nine. 
it, it's incredibly worked out. I mean, he was he was an amazing writer. Uh, and yes, exactly what you said. And I'm sure he would have been purpose, purposeful about that. You know, this means I've now got to go back and read chapter one and chapter 11, <laughs> chapter two, chapter 10. You know, well, you know this is going to take us weeks now before we... Oh, well, the books again. we've got not, not much else to do at the moment, uh, uh, Stephen. No, that's true. Uh, another uh, thing that sort of ties in, may, you know, the, um, I'm trying to think, I can't remember the name of the, or, you know, the kind that, one of the things that Carol would have known, or Charles Dodgson would have known, would have been obviously Greek mythology as well from his, um, from his studies and typical school. And so the, um, the kind of heroic journey, um, the Campbell, you know, um, you know, is a is a little bit like um, Alice's journey as well. You know, Alice, you know, going into the underworld, you know, her own odyssey. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Campbell, there you go. I knew if I stretched, it would come to me in the end. The hero with a thousand faces. And yeah. So forth. Yeah. Um, right. I, I think. Uh, you know, the whole thing is, is about the underworld in a sense, insofar as he's kind of trying to come to terms with death. Mm. Uh, is there something after death? And I think his inclination is to say, yes, there is. Um, but it, it's a meditation. It's a, a meditation of great art. Uh, so to think in terms of the, the hero traveling to the underworld, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Homer or Virgil or, or what have you uh, is is utterly appropriate. Um, uh, I I think his final judgment is um, is positive. There there is something for all of us afterwards, and uh, the Ouroboros is the emblem of that. I'm not going to try to hug all the questions, but another thing that's occurred to me is, um, and roughly at the same time, and there will be other people on the call who are more knowledgeable than I am, that um, the topic that you're talking about, sort of, um, we call it life after death, this one, um, the Water Babies was a sort of contemporary or slightly before the books that dealt with um, similar themes. Uh, Charles Kingsley, I think. Charles right? Kingsley, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe it was uh, uh, a habit of thought of the time, but really, we still think about it. We can't not think about it. And so it, it just stays current. We don't know. We may have a, an inclination this way or that way, but um, there's no absolute resolution. And he is sort of reflecting our own wondering with his own hope. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, Steve mentioned um, analysis, psychoanalysis, and um, uh, as as not particularly relevant, but in uh, in Jungian analysis, the Ouroboros is the symbol of wholeness, and um, whether. Carol or Dodson ever thought he was whole in that psychological sense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say, but um, he put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So in one sense, in the book, and I'm just wondering what your take is on, on that um, line of thought, that it's, it's, and I'm very glad to say that when we, when we put a, um, stone to commemorate Lewis Carroll into um, Western Abbey in the Poets' Corner. It was circular, and I'm now rather wishing we'd had the, <laughs> had the Ouroboros on it, but um, life, what is it? Is all our life then but a dream? Are the words written on it? I don't know if you've looked so much at the actual man himself, and how you, if you feel that he this made him a whole person, as it were, this writing. Uh, I think that's, that's right. I mean, he didn't have to write Alice in Wonderland. He wrote it, yes, for the little girls, but also for himself. 
Mm. And especially as we see him or as we imagine seeing him revising and shaping and giving this uh, undercurrent uh, greater definition, uh, I think it's reasonable to think, yes, he's, he's providing some completeness, some wholeness. Perhaps he's responding to whatever doubt he had. Uh, you know, he, he was not always certain of everything. He had his, his, I don't know what he called them, night problems or something that when he would be unable to sleep. Uh, he, he had his um, moments of uncertainty, just like we all do. And this, these two books provide a beautiful pattern, which may have been a counterweight to whatever doubts he may have felt or may have remembered having felt. So the idea that this made him whole seems utterly fair and plausible to me. Thank you. And thank you for a fascinating talk. Oh, thank you. Is it, are there any more questions from other people? Here. <laughs> Thanks. It's not really a question so much as just um, just to really kind of agree, um, Richard, if I may call you Richard, uh, uh, in in the sense of um, really being very much in agreement with you in terms of the idea of Carol as somebody who is really carefully plotting and structuring his work and at great pains in the positioning of um, different aspects of the of the work and and I think that sort of sense of him as you know a really careful craftsman of his work and you know we we sort of think of him as sort of often you know when we start talking about the biography and so on it kind of he he become and I suppose also with this kind of subject matter it can become quite sort of mystical and sort of inspired and quite romantic. But I think also what this kind of analysis shows is what a careful craftsperson he is and a grafter and a really sort of is very carefully building from sort of a series of um, of kind of smaller pieces, this, this much bigger um, work. And I'm saying this um, sort of partly because of plotting out recently the positioning of all of the songs in the two books and seeing how closely they so they're they're all concentrated in the second half of the books and they're really carefully and closely sort of um that they, they sort of concentrated in the same sorts of places in both and i just think there's so much of this that um takes place with with this work and um and so anything that kind of shows shows his um artisanship <laughs> his craft i think is great so thank you thank you for that that comment we started by talking about poe and poe was a writer who very much worked from the end backwards he had everything figured out now of course as he's writing he's he's imagining sentence after sentence but the whole shape is already worked out and that's one kind of writer there are writers who who would rather write not knowing what comes next and that's another kind of literature. Um, but I do have a special admiration for these artists who figure so much out so that it all works, not so that it gets in our way, but if we want to find it, it's there to be found. There's a, there's a joy to that finding and a gratitude towards his, for his having uh, imagined this, this mystery, this puzzle, this puzzle for us. Sometimes I think I, in popular culture, down the rabbit hole uh, is a sort of uh, uh, a figure for uh, loss of control and wildness and disorder and so forth. But actually, I think in the case of Lewis Carroll, which is where the, the phrase down the rabbit hole comes from, Wonderland is a place of enormous order. Hmm. And that's thanks to the artistry, as you're saying, of, of Lewis Carroll. Yeah, it's an interesting um, 
part of me that you and Kira have explained. I mean, as I've just scribbled down, you never really thought of him as a, a grafter and a craftsman. Um, that, that's not something that's normally associated with um, Lewis Carroll. The, the general explanations of that, the stories were sort of um, handed down by himself to himself um, from when he was young. But, um, but this is quite, you know, and yet, but um, the other thing that I remember is that in the hunting of the snark, um, a myth that possibly he created himself was that um, he started with the last line of the poem and then, and then, and then wrote it to work to the end. The snark was a boojum, you see. Right? Yeah. And, that was, and so the story is that he was walking in, out in Guildford somewhere, uh, thought of the last line, and then wrote the whole of it um, just with just with that in his head. Right. Could I could I add a comment to that? Because um, quite often we think of um, Lewis Carroll as someone who just had this in wild imagination. He could pluck these ideas from nowhere, which maybe he did, but I I don't think that's incompatible with the idea of him being this hard grafter, which I, uh, is very much how I see it. If you if you compare Carol with Salvador Dali, who comes up with these completely wacky wild ideas, but when he comes to paint them, my goodness, he works like Lewis Carroll did, carefully crafting everything, going back over and over again. And, and the uh, the surrealism, if, if you want, comes from the finding the initial idea, but the with Carol and with Dali and many other writers as well. Um, it's in that final careful crafting and you see it throughout Lewis Carroll's life. I mean, everything he did, he went back over and over again. The number of times he went back and changed the spelling of can't and won't and adding an L to whatever word that needed it and so on. He, he was just, it was craftsmanship, always improving it. But I think that the initial craziness of, you know, walking out on the downs just in outside Guildford and coming up with this vague strange wording and ideas in his head that's the um what's the kind of the right word now but that's the the um germination of it that's not the right word that's the inception of it I think is what I mean but it comes from the very the comes from the very careful um the word the care very careful crafting and the beautiful use of language yes Absolutely. I think the I think the term is retrosynthesis. So you start at the end and you build everything back to the beginning. I like that. And just to add, I completely agree with Mark. And I would say that Carol was almost a, a, a Dmitri Mendeleev. He put together his books like a periodic table, if you like. So there are correspondences and interactions all the way through. I like the comparison. <laughs> yes. With, with, with Humpty Dumpty being hydrogen, if you like. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, God. So now, so now I guess that one of you is on the call. More homework for you, He's you Stephen. A periodic table with all the characters of the two books. Okay, I'm afraid... Um, You've just volunteered. I look forward to that um, piece of uh, academic analysis. C could I just mention that uh, you brought up chemistry there, which is my subject, and uh, um, there's a famous um, story about uh, a, a, a chemist called Kekuli who um, dreamt the Ouroboros. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Somebody, you'd know that, yeah. I and, think it had uh, to do with benzene. Is that's it? right, it's the benzene. Yeah. He dreamt the structure yes. of benzene, which had been eluding people for, for so long, and uh, it came to him in a dream. So, yeah. Right. So On the application. upstairs of a bus, um, just around the corner from uh, from the Lewis Carroll Society meeting place, yes. Calculate. A snake eating a snake's tail. That's right. <laughs> so and all the it. electrons are right spinning around, you see, in a circle. Yes. In hexagonal circle. Well, hexagonally, yeah. Benzene ring. Benzene ring, yes. Oh, Famous story. Only a chemist could use the word hexagonal circle. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, as soon as I said it, I realised it wasn't right. But, <laughs> but 
but it is hexagonal and it is the electrons just sort of you know they 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 are yes. spinning around and on top of the hexagon as it were <laughs> the chemistry yeah and delocalized orbitals that's right <laughs> yes yes yeah uh, that's a brilliant talk richard thank you it very is. much well, I thought, um... Yeah, I, mean, I think on the last topic, I mean, there's nothing really much that I can add really um, in that even we talk about the hunting of the snark, that even if he did that as a last line, you can bet that he'd been ruminating on it for a long period. Um, and then once he had that thought, he suddenly had the thing fully formed because actually he'd been working on, you know, and I, I know there is another term for it, but he'd been sort of working on it on his, in his spare capacity in the back of the brain. Yes, I, and I think Paul worked on the Raven and, and first, similarly. I, I think uh, it was a, a habit of mind that, uh, that he had to know the, the end before he began. Could I ask you, Richard, um, do you know Carol's um, ghost poem, Phantasmagoria? Because um, whenever I've read that, I can't get Poe out of my mind. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll look at it again. Well, you, there, there's, why is a raven like a writing desk? One answer is Poe wrote on both. I don't know if that's what he was thinking, but he certainly, I think, would have read Poe. He couldn't have not read him. Yeah, we have, I think it's a regular, um, up until this year, for a few years, I was editing the, the newsletter and it was a regular um, feature on um, someone coming up with a solution for why is a raven like a writing desk. So that, unfortunately, is going to be an Ouroboros um, solution <laughs> as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, if there's... Are there any other questions from anybody? I'll just... Uh, not, a, not, a, not a question, but we shouldn't forget uh, we, in all our cogitations about these things that uh, Dodson was also a man who might very easily have just thought uh, that a, a riddle which asks why it's a raven like a writing desk does in fact not have an answer, just as indeed the, the Hatter doesn't know when Ch Alice, Alice challenges him. So, you know, part of the, the, the fun of uh, Carol, it seems to me, is that potentially, and, and maybe he even delighted in the fact and would delight in the fact of the fact that we have spent so many years uh, since his writing, analyzing and trying to find explanations for it all, that he was the kind of character who could have come up with two totally unrelated objects for whatever reason, uh, without necessarily having an answer to them. And that is just as much a, uh, an area of playfulness uh, as you find frequently in the poem of Edward Lear, for example, where entirely ludicrous things are placed side by side with no motive to their being there other than the playfulness of the writer. So, you know, it's always worth, it, it's always worth speculating, but it's also worth remembering that there might not be an answer. Yeah, the, the, the other thing that I thought was that when going back to Kira and Liz's point about craft, craftsmanship and grafting, that might explain why 150 years later that we're still analysing it as well, because it is such a, a finely honed piece of what it means. And, and we see the same with, I mean, you're right, you know, using Edgar Allan Poe and other writers, that writers who you tend to go back and find something different in, depending on your mood, depending on the other things that you've read at the same time. You know, are people who spend some time you know, concocting a very intricate, intricate structure that you don't even notice is there? You know, you're just reading the entertainment, but you don't spot that actually this is a, you know, a fine work of art. And it's not just in writing, you know, you'll get it in music and in, um, you know, and in uh, art as well. I'd love to know what Selwyn thinks, because Selwyn's uh, with us tonight, Selwyn Goodacre, and he probably, more than anybody, uh, has an awareness of just how many changes and revisions uh, these books went through, because he's, he's uh, uh, combed them with a very fine tooth comb. Uh, and so I, I don't know whether he's willing to tell us, but what you've just said, Steve, strikes me as being also something which is shared with, with other writers. And, and though there isn't a close 
uh, correlation between Lewis Carroll and Tolkien. Uh, there is an example of another writer who was constantly changing and revising. And I remember a, a statement by his son, uh, Tolkien's son, Christopher, where he was talking about the map that Tolkien created for Middle Earth, where in fact, every time Tolkien had to discovered a new aspect of his fantasy, uh, he was pasting new bits of the map on until the map was so all over the, the, the study because it just had more and more accretions to it. So, you know, the, I think it is a common thing and maybe, who knows, whether it's uh, an obsession with academic writers who turn to fantasy, um, that this drives them maybe towards this uh, endless revision and uh, uh, extrapolation on what they're creating or maybe it is just that they had a proper job and they weren't reliant on having to write books for money uh, and therefore they had the time to indulge themselves in revising their work where those of us I say very loosely can take including myself don't have the time to go back and revise and revise because you're desperately trying to write something to follow up to earn the bread and butter. So then have you got any view on that or do you want to? So no, Kira, uh, the other Kirara, do you have a question? I don't have a question, but can I make some short comment? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm from Japan and I'm studying children's literature as a postgraduate in London now. So thank you for the fascinating talk today. The currently I'm writing about uh, I'm writing an essay about absurdity in Carol Carol's Alice and Edward Lear's A Book of Nonsense. And today I am very pleased to realize that it's absurdity. I think it means surreal imagination. Uh, lead to the beautiful symmetrical result. So, yes, I'm very happy today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your good comment. Thank you. Good luck with your work. <laughs> Thank you. And if, and if you have any questions, you've got a panel of experts here, you can always ask mm -hmm. on Edward Lear, Tolkien, Lewis Carroll. I think yeah, we're kind of throwing in another author because I disagree a little bit with um, with Brian, uh, an author who was around at the same time as Lewis Carroll, who um, Robert Louis Stevenson, and um, this was definitely a guy who was a writer who had to write for a living, and actually he threw away the manuscript um, of uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, I think, or lost it and had to rewrite it. But funnily enough, I think that was also from um, from a dream as well, or, or a nightmare, whichever way you want to put it. But again, it's a it's another book of contrasts, symmetry. You know, they, they maybe that you know, at the time it was a it was a challenge that they were all dealing with in, in entirely different ways. I don't know whether Richard would agree with this, but it seems to me that this contrast, this, uh, um, you know, what you might describe as the yin and yang of, of people's uh, uh, perceptions and uh, behavior is something which is as old as, old as humanity and the oldest literature, uh, it all, uh, nearly all hinges on this contrast between good and evil, right and wrong, you know, the, the simplest possible uh, dimension of way of looking at people. I mean, um, and I don't know whether, because Richard has touched on uh, uh, Dodson's religious beliefs, but it seems to me that plays in completely to uh, his, what would be his a very, um, I would say, orthodox view of, of Christian belief and Christian faith and the, the doctrine that is espoused in the book where he would have obviously revered in the Bible. Would you agree with that, Richard? I think so. And uh, you're reminding me, when I would uh, talk in class about uh, uh, chiasmus, I would go back to the book of Genesis. Uh, there is a passage uh, that you'll all recognize. God made man in his image. In his image made he him. Well, that's gorgeous. I mean, that's, that's how many, you know, thousands of years ago. Yes. Uh, so 
uh, Lewis Carroll would have known that, he would have recognized it, he would have been attentive to the rhetoric of the Bible, and uh, and and other writers too. I mean, foul is fair and fair is foul. It it comes and it comes and it comes. And Joyce and many many writers. Uh, so yeah, I think that. Uh, that the balance is something that go ba goes back, the balance of polarities that goes goes back in, in our literature, and Lewis Carroll would have been particularly uh, sensitive to it. Okay, well, I, I haven't got any more questions. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? And a quick, quick scan of the... Uh... Okay, well, if there isn't any more questions, then I'll um, wind it up for this evening. I mean, I want to thank um, Jane Skelly for organising it um, and Sarah Jane Willoughby for supporting the, um, the evening as well. Um, and as I said, what we're looking to do is to, um, to put it on our YouTube channel because I'm sure there will be lots of people who will be very interested in it. You know, and also to thank you, Richard, for, you know, a fascinating and um, completely unexpected talk. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm sure there'll be lots of people who'll be going back. Um, and, and I know plenty of people on the um, on the talk you know, and, and having a rethink about some of our interpretations of Carol as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you all for your interest and your attention and your good responses. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to have been welcomed and uh, appreciate uh, this exchange. Thank you, Richard. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.